As you saw, what we decided to do in terms of the structure of the conference is really having one extensive conversation with different pieces within it, okay? So getting out some of the data about hourly workers and then a business perspective from someone who's like living, consulting with businesses, and then a policy perspective from both Democratic and Republican um, experiences. And then do the same thing in the afternoon, <laughs> focusing on salaried workers. Um, again, understanding that it's, that doesn't necessarily correlate exactly with the low income and high income. We have low income salaried workers, um, but often the salaried workers have those jobs that are characterized not by extreme flexibility, but more rigidity, and therefore for them, the FWAs is that first part of FWAs, that is more flexibility in schedule, reduced hours, et cetera. So you will also hear some stuff in terms of comparison between hourly and salaried as well. So I am very pleased that we have um, a same sort of um, structure as this morning. Um, and again, um, a, the first paper looking at the overview of data Okay, so both for this morning and this afternoon, we wanted our first presenter not to be presenting on any specific research, targeted research that he or she was doing, but giving more the overview of the lay of the land. So Lonnie Golden is going to start with that. Again, you've got everyone's bios. I'm just going to say that um, Lonnie Golden is an associate professor of economics and labor studies at Penn State University, Abington, and was one of the first labor economist that I met when I was doing this stuff. Lonnie and Bob Drago, you know, are the, were the first labor economists in this that I met. And very much looking forward to Lonnie's pres overview uh, presentation. And then Tam uh, Tammy Krimer Sedlick, who is director of research at UCLA Center on Everyday Lives of Families. Many of you who've been to the Sloan conferences have seen the really fascinating video stuff from self um, it was definitely something that made an impact on me, and then I know on Katie, the first times we went to the Sloan conferences, and we're particularly pleased to having Tammy uh, give some of the um, data, not just from UCLA, but also from the Italian families that they have been looking at as well. And then, so they'll each get their 25 minutes, <laughs> timer, blah, blah, blah. Hopefully there won't be a fire alarm in the middle of theirs. Um, and then in terms of the response, again, as I said to the morning folks, we asked the respondents, you know, not to have anything prepared, but once they hear this, what are their reactions and thoughts? And so Kathy Lingle, someone that I know many of you know as well, who's the director for Alliance for Work-Life Progress at World at Work, and someone, again, a very early person that I met while I was doing this um, and has been a real resource in terms of um, sort of how things work inside businesses. Um, and then for our policy reaction, again, making sure that we have people with very good um, business and employee pedigree, but able to see and understand all perspectives. That was the approach. <laughs> we have David Fortney, um, who is a co-founder of Fortney and Scott, which is a law firm here in town. Um, David was also the um, chief legal officer of the U.S. Department of Labor in Washington, D.C., under the first President Bush. David also um, served on our legal working group, which met for about a year and a half, seven plaintiff lawyers, seven management lawyers, over a period of 18 months, meeting and talking about these issues of flexible work arrangements, time off, our effort to see whether there could be a reasonable conversation. And there was, not necessarily consensus, but we had a reasonable conversation, and David was an active member on that, and he has also agreed to join the National Advisory Commission on Workplace Flexibility. We have four members of the Legal Working Group who also are serving on the National Advisory Commission. And then Devin McGraw, who is the director of the Center for Democracy and Technology's Health Privacy Project. And before she took that job, she was the chief operating officer of the National Partnership for Women and Families. And, you know, I, know, I may not be on all of her bio stuff, but she did also, she was the acting di the director of the Federal Legislation Clinic for two years. So she's someone I've known since law school, actually. Um, and Devin also uh, very graciously has agreed to be on our National Advisory Commission. 
Um, so I am looking forward to everyone's comments, um, papers and then comments, and we're going to let Lonnie take it away. Oh, you guys should have, I think you've got Lonnie's presentation in front of you on the tables. Um, Maureen's and Jennifer's are being copied, and they will be available for you after this session in the back. Lonnie. Good afternoon. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks to, to the host. Thanks to my supporters. Glad to be here. <laughs> I'd rather be outside like you would, but uh, I know what happens when you take class outside. Yeah. Oh, yes. oh, you're right. That's a good idea, Kathy. Um, and I'm thanking my collaborators as well. Without them, uh, none of this would have happened. Uh, my task today really is to bridge some of the gaps. and. Um, to provide the overview that would do that, and uh, in particular about the flexible work arrangements, that's the topic of today's uh, and tomorrow's conference, uh, about the demand among workers and the supply, or what we call access, uh, the gap between um, access and use, I'll touch on that a little bit, and the uh, gap between the salaried and hourly workers, which is what I've been asked to address. And uh, in defense of the salaried worker, given uh, this morning's session, uh, let's, uh, somebody mentioned a psychology class, and if I got it right, is it Maslow's Pyramid? That once you settle your survival and uh, basic needs, then you move on to security, which like we all do when we have low incomes and we want to have job security, income security, health, uh, once uh, health is established. And beyond that, we want to start reaching for the higher, uh, the higher ups of uh, autonomy and discretion and self-actualization, and then eventually try to reach happiness and bliss. And just let's just remember that a lot of our people in working class in um, hourly paid jobs are striving to be in that kind of position. So we, we, we want to create the conditions for them to advance and be happier uh, over time and make those uh, salary jobs uh, as high quality as they can be. Um, I'm also going to uh, steer clear of all the disciplinary approaches, but you'll see that we are trying to bridge the gap with uh, common data sets between the various perspectives, like labor economics, occupational safety and health, which a little bit will come into this presentation, and um, as, as well as sociology and human resource management. And um, uh, let me ask that I also, I'm always trying to bridge the different sides of my brain as well, which is the th uh, theoretical side, we have to have a consistent model in theory, because I'm trained as an economist, and the empirical side, what's the real truth out there, does it conform uh, to the theory, and then the policy side, what are we going to do with this, are we really going to change the world or not, uh, let's make this more useful. So uh, I'll be trying to bridge my brain as well as uh, some of these gaps uh, between the disciplines and, and the literature. And in, the, and in our surveys. Uh, here's your refresher on um, the, the uh, flexible work arrangements and time off. Uh, the ones that are in bold um, are the ones that I'll be uh, focusing on, specifically because that's where the street light is. That's where we can find the most data. And so we look for our lost keys only under these street lights. Um, but that's not to say that they're more important than the other ones, of course. Uh, the available surveys are the, um, the current population survey, the really uh, large monthly survey conducted by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Every few years, uh, they suddenly put in a supplement that asks about work schedules, and uh, we get a very large sample size, even among those that, uh, the quarter sample that reports their earnings levels and pay or hourly uh, or salary status. Uh, the general social survey, which just released its 2006 quality of work life module, is something I'll draw on heavily. Uh, and there was a survey that was uh, fairly useful, although Peter Berg shares my criticism that the sampling and methodology has uh, some issues, but in terms of the kind of questions they asked were very useful, very insightful. And I didn't want to slight anybody. There are some great surveys conducted and administered by, by some people in this room uh, from the National Study of Change in Workforce and the just released National Survey of Employers and the Work Family Development, uh, Work Family Direction Survey uh, that came out recently as well. Okay, so here's the, uh, the first overview, is that uh, the salaried workforce comprises about a third of the, uh, of the workforce. Um, the general social survey does have this uh, category called other, which are people that are on contract or are, are temporary agency workers, and we're not going to address them, at least for this conference. Uh, but among full-time workers, uh, just less than a third are considered salaried. 
and they're slightly more likely to be uh, white, married, and more educated. Uh, that's one's going to be hard to read unless you're up here in the front couple of tables. Basically what this says is that salaried workers are concentrated in certain industries. I can't read on this little screen either. Um, but it's uh, not surprising. They're in the um, finance, insurance, real estate, and uh, primarily in entertainment, recreation, professional services, and public administration. Uh, they tend to earn on average in the general social survey. They just give you a range of incomes uh, to report annual incomes. And uh, salaried workers make more. On average, it looks like if you're just going to take some midpoints, about 16,000 more. And in part, that's because they work relatively longer hours. So their average work week is about three more hours than hourly paid workers in the sample. Uh, just to do that cut, there's a distinction between salary and hourly workers in terms of some of their consequences that are relevant to work life. The GSS had a battery of questions about uh, self-reported subjective um, uh, consequences uh, or experiences, and one of them being how much do you experience uh, or how frequently you experience conflict between uh, work and family life. And you can see that having a salary job actually um, reduces the percentage that say never. So salaried people, uh, maybe in part because of their relatively longer hours per week, do experience this interference between job and family life. Uh, there's some indication that there's um, a little bit of effect on stress levels, as reported, but not so much on uh, the daily fatigue question. So for the purposes of the overview today, we're just going to look at um, the, the three types of flexible work arrangements and the one type of uh, short-term time off. So this was um, a segment of a larger project that uh, Kathy funded for me to create a, a batch of uh, survey questions to best get at benchmarking and tracking over time in a quantitative way the success or lack of success until today uh, in actually influencing uh, the course of flexible work arrangements and the spread throughout the workforce. So number one, flexible scheduling. So relying on the current population survey, the last time they did the supplement was 04. The empirical analysis I do is actually from the 01. Uh, but about 27, 28% of the workforce says yes to the question that they're able to uh, vary their work hours on a daily basis, or they're allowed to. Uh, it's slightly higher among parents. It's slightly higher uh, for uh, parents uh, among parents who have preschool children, but not a huge difference there. Uh, fathers get a little bit more uh, than mothers, and that might surprise some, not surprise others. Uh, there is a slight gender advantage for men, but the, um, uh, the last couple of CPS questionnaires on this actually asked, as a follow-up question, if you have such daily schedule flexibility, was it part of a formal plan? And it actually turns out that women have better access to that. That might be a little bit of self-selection, unclear. Uh, but uh, women actually have better access than men to the formal type of flex time, but men have a much bigger advantage in terms of informal or not formal types of flexibility in their daily schedule. And as you can see on the bottom, there's a, a pretty huge discrepancy between salaried workers uh, which is an approximation, of course, of the exempt workforce, not a, not a, uh, a completely accurate one. But hourly workers, on average, uh, more like one in eight have uh, this type of daily schedule flexibility. And a lot of that discrepancy arises because of what industry they're employed in, professional services, uh, insurance and real estate, private household services. Some of these come in very high in terms of uh, workers' access in the industry to uh, having flexible work schedules. Some are quite low, including uh, educational services, which wouldn't surprise you if you're thinking K through 12 teachers in terms of varying the starting and ending times of their work day. And of course, some of the uh, blue collar uh, jobs concentrated in these industries probably brings down the ones on the right. Um, it's lawyers and judges, since I'm at a law school, uh, that get uh, the most out of any uh, occupation, uh, the most access to flexibility a lot of it being informal, and, uh, and most of these are, you know, high-skilled, uh, high-educational requirement type of jobs, including teachers uh, with colleges and universities are getting pretty high flexibility. Of course, we know that that's what keeps us in those jobs, and it's only, um, it's not the pay, 
Um, that's what keeps us hunting for grants, too, I might add. Uh, but uh, every once in a while, a naive administrator comes in and wants to force their faculty to keep regular office and advising hours, and uh, they learn right away why academics are there. They're, they don't want to be told when to be there. And uh, that's part of the deal. You pretend to pay us, and we pretend to be at work, uh, like <laughs> the old Soviet Union model. And. Um, <laughs> And you can't change that arrangement unless you're going to create what's called the compensating wage differential uh, in my economic parlance. Uh, some of the lowest ranking occupations are actually in the healthcare fields, including those with skills. Uh, not surprising if you know uh, and you hear complaints about nurses and schedules, sorry about the formatting there, uh, but mostly blue collar type of jobs. Um, there's also this um, uh, remarkable U shape by hours of work. That is to say, um, there's some sort of mechanism at work which uh, leads to workers that have relatively longer work weeks, those who are working the 10 hour uh, days on average, uh, to get more access to flexibility. And it's almost exclusively through uh, the informal flexibility. So there must be something going on, maybe informally in the workplace, an exchange for you pretend to work extra and I pretend to give you flexibility, uh, but, or, or really deliver the flexibility, or really deliver the long work hours. Uh, there's a fairly good consistency between these different data sets. Uh, the quality work life module found that about 35% of workers uh, respond that they can often uh, change their starting and quitting times in that WI, uh, about the same percentage. And the recently released National Survey of Employers uh, asking employers, they said they grant this at least to some employees. So uh, we're looking at 30 to 40% of the workforce that currently has access to that. Uh, what about some of the consequences? Well, in particular, the one about work-life interference. Uh, what happens to workers that um, say they often or sometimes have the ability to change their daily time of work? Uh, what this uh, shows is a uh, fairly uh, strong indication that uh, they, those who have such uh, flexibility are much more likely than others uh, to say uh, uh, never. Uh, that they never have uh, this type of work family interference. So uh, there is some impact there of providing these work schedules. Uh, maybe a little impact on the uh, daily fatigue as well. Uh, at the end of each one of these type of um, uh, flexible work arrangement indicators, I'm going to have a slide or two about the trend. And um, at least according to the CPS, uh, the 1990s was uh, boom uh, were boom years for uh, schedule flexibility, but since then it's been about a plateau. Uh, maybe they have another supplement coming up and we can see what's happened since 2004, but it's no higher in uh, 2004 than it was back in 1997 in May, which is what the um, snapshot <laughs> provides. What about the issue of overtime and the control of hours? Uh, one of the key indicators is this notion of uh, do folks have to put in overtime on a mandatory or as opposed to voluntary uh, basis? Uh, almost two-thirds of the workforce in the GSS uh, responds that they put in an extra day beyond their usual work schedule in the previous month, and uh, about a third of those uh, it was required. Um, the, uh, the exact verbiage of some of these questions, if you're interested, for the third of us, uh, their academics are really focused on this sort of stuff. Uh, exactly how they ask these questions is in the paper handout. Uh, but it comes down to uh, in 02 and 06 being about the same, uh, almost 30% uh, of the workforce faces mandatory overtime conditions, and uh, about one in five actually work it. So that is to say they're both working some overtime and it was because it was mandatory. That is to say, some people face this as a condition but didn't work overtime in the previous month. And you get a similar uh, type of snapshot, maybe slightly lower estimate from the WIA in part because of the way they asked the question. But they also had a question about whether you uh, have time to plan far enough in advance and they actually found that it's uh, less than half the workforce when they have overtime scheduled feel as if it's uh, too sudden uh, uh, to plan ahead generally. And what does this uh, mandatory overtime condition do? Well, the variable that says must work yes means that they f uh, face and work mandatory overtime with extra hours, and they're more likely to say that they uh, experience stress from work. Uh, they're also far more likely to say that they often have uh, their uh, demands of their job inter interfere with the demands of family life, and uh, there's some indication that they very often feel used up at the end of the day as well. 
So it has some bite. Uh, to make a distinction between hourly and salaried, now these scales uh, might exaggerate this a bit, but it, it shows that at least between 02 and 06, uh, the segment of the workforce that says yes, they work these mandatory overtime hours, or face them anyway, uh, is about the same level, but there seems to be a shift. It's more, um, a greater percentage of the hourly workers are saying they face this, and a slightly lower percentage, at least over this four-year period, of salaried workers. So that's the way it's been trending. Uh, with, the C with the CPS, uh, there's actually a, a fairly large segment that when asked what their usual hours are, um, they actually respond that they can't specify. And they're thrown in a category called hours vary. And I know from this morning's discussion, there's a lot of interest in this. And uh, the results are a little preliminary, so I'm not real comfortable uh, reporting them. But uh, it's amazing that about 10% of the workforce says that they can't specify their usual work week. And indeed, uh, part of that might be due to the fact that in this supplement, uh, they're actually asked about to specify the typical starting at any times of their work day. And a growing trend over time, now up to 16%, one in six workers say uh, that their work day and varies. And they can't specify time, even a usual or typical time. Uh, the question about satisfaction with hours. Um, refers to a question which asks folks, are they, uh, would they prefer to have the same hours at the same income, or given the choice, would you want to have more hours and more income, or fewer hours and uh, less income? And uh, not surprisingly, given the, the composition of our workforce, uh, a, a greater percentage, the, the greatest percentage are satisfied with their current hours, about two-thirds of the workforce are pretty much where they want to be. Uh, but a really large percentage say they want more income, especially when you put income in the question, they get focused on that for some obvious reasons. Uh, but there is a segment of the workforce between 7 and 8 percent that says uh, that they would exchange uh, income for fewer hours. And this really gets at, I think, the dissatisfaction question more because it frames it as you have to make some sort of sacrifice. Uh, maybe this would be higher if, uh, if you're asked if you want to go to um, part-time, uh, but people understand when you go to part-time hours, it comes with a part-time status, which means you're sacrificing benefits and certain uh, crucial health uh, like coverage like health insurance. And maybe some uh, social status as well by going to part-time. Uh, some of the highlights of uh, the overemployment rate analysis uh, finds that not too surprisingly, it escalates as you get to longer work weeks. So those that are working for, uh, 50 hours are far more likely than those who are working 40 hours or, uh, or 35 to 39 in terms of uh, whether they would choose that. Uh, where we see overemployment also escalate is in the higher earning levels, especially among women, once reaching $900 a week. Uh, they're uh, the only group whose overemployment rate of 21 percent uh, exceeds their underemployment rate, and it's concentrated in certain occupations. It's concentrated by demographics. And surprisingly, there's no association, maybe even a negative association, uh, between the uh, likelihood of reducing overemployment and having a flexible schedule. So these are really two different indicators of flexibility. Uh, having more flexible day schedules will not resolve overemployment. That's what the suggestion is. Time's up. Yeah. Uh, well, that would be an interesting time-up thing, but no. <laughs> Keep it rolling until we see smoke. <laughs> and then five more minutes, and then you can go. <laughs> um, one of the uh, surveys that... Um, uh, got at the question about work time options better than others was conducted by the Peter Hart Associates a few years ago, uh, which found, I think, interestingly, not only that people uh, maybe have a slightly higher preference than 7 percent, but when you push it into the future, in a sense, you negate some of the immediate income sacrifice, people are interested in uh, using uh, this option uh, for the uh, relatively uh, shorter work week, but also uh, a relatively shorter work year, if they, I suppose, if they can time when they take their time off. So there's more interest out there that might be indicated by uh, just 7 or 8 percent of the workforce saying they'd be willing to forego income for uh, fewer work hours. Uh, one question, since it came up before, uh, 
uh, in last night's discussion about this issue of compensatory time. Uh, now, um, it got to be uh, a real emotional battle about uh, who's entitled to more pay and time off. But as it turns out, if you ask people if they'd rather have it, uh, and their overtime rewarded with pay versus uh, time off. There are some hourly workers that would value the time off more, but it's the salaried workers, in fact, those who the legislation was not designed to serve at all, and that was the problem with it. It's actually salaried workers, almost a third of them say they'd be interested in tracking their hours and uh, maybe getting some sort of future comp time off. And it's uh, much more among the uh, exempt workers and those who have uh, less vacation days. Uh, finally, uh, in terms of uh, the arrangements, the time off issue, uh, the uh, short-term time off measured by the family uh, uh, time off on a short-term basis to deal with family or personal matters. Uh, if folks find that um, there's a, a not very hard to find time to do that at their job, uh, they're more, much more likely to say that they, uh, or less likely to say they never encounter stress, or more likely to say the other categories in the middle. But uh, it seems to um, prevent stress at, at the job. It also seems to prevent uh, some of this uh, job interference with family life, and also uh, impacts on uh, people's feeling of fatigue. Uh, some of that might be due to the relationship, its relationship, uh, the relationship of the difficulty taking time off. If it's very hard or somewhat hard, uh, that not surprisingly gets more difficult as workers work very long hours. So there's a gradation there. There's also a relationship between these different types of flexibility or inflexibility in this case of mandatory overtime. Uh, if one has overtime that is mandatory, it seems to have some bite in terms of reducing workers' flexibility to take sh short-term time off. That they find it uh, much harder, not surprisingly, if uh, they're being required to work overtime and it's not their choice. It might not be their choice. They might have anyway, but they argue that it's a requirement of their job. Uh, one of the few surveys that actually asked the questions about uh, time off uh, framed it as this. Would you, do you have or would you use or would you like to use the option of taking extra time off with, without pay uh, beyond your usual uh, time off type of programs? And uh, not surprisingly, if you received a salary, you probably had a little bit more access, uh, 35 to 30 percent in that option. But interestingly, uh, more hourly workers use that than salaried workers and about the same uh, would consider using it. This is what, uh, this is the gap I would refer to as the salaried gap. So in terms of access, salaried workers get a little bit more than hourly workers. Okay, so uh, make sure you get every percentage there. Um, <laughs> so, as the new data keep rolling out, we have to redo all these tables, but um, we get, uh, we're trying to put, uh, put together uh, the various levels of availability or access uh, and how that might short, there might be a shortfall between that and the demand or that workers value this is important and they don't get it. And there's also some other surveys which give us estimates of who's using these flexible working arrangements. And finally, there's, uh, for today's purposes, uh, differences between the salaried and hourly workers. And you can see that uh, there's some status gaps that are quite large, like in daily flexible uh, scheduling flexibility, and uh, some that are relatively small, like both salaried and hourly workers facing about the same level of mandatory overtime. And that just continues on to the next. So just as an example, whoop, uh, about 50% would consider using the option of unpaid, but only 29% have it, so that uh, the use gap there uh, would be 21%. What are some of the trends, at least over the last uh, few years, a couple, a couple of surveys reached just a few years back, some a little bit longer. Uh, so what would that look like? Uh, one of the ones that's a little bit puzzling is that uh, fewer percentage 
in the ISSP uh, version of the GSS uh, answered the question. Fewer workers said that they regard the importance of uh, flexibility as very important or important. Uh, maybe uh, we're victims of our own success. Maybe people are taking it for granted uh, that, uh, and they don't know it until it goes away, uh, that they don't know what they got till it's gone, and, uh, and maybe um, And maybe they don't regard it as important because uh, they think it's a feature of more and more jobs. Uh, there is, on the other hand, uh, some indication that there's a slight gain with, uh, among folks who say within limits they get to decide their working hours. So I guess the takeaway here is that there has been some progress on daily schedule flexibility. Uh, it has plateaued uh, in some regards, but in other ways um, workers are getting more uh, discretion or feel like they have more discretion. Uh, there's also a trend uh, a little bit toward uh, feeling more conflict or more interference between work and family life. Not much action on the front of how hard is it to take time off, so that measure of flexibility uh, seems to be about stagnant. Uh, but there's some indication that the, uh, there's not only an advantage for salaried workers that uh, stands to reason, but in some areas that advantage has grown. Uh, so to wrap up, some of the key findings are that um, there are, uh, it seems to be more availability of some of these flexible work arrangements, uh, but they seem to be quite um, unequally distributed and continue to be so, especially by occupation and industry type. Um, Salary workers generally, not surprisingly, have more scheduling flexibility. I'm reading this because uh, only. So have oh, that one. Gotcha. Uh, salaried workers tend to be more constrained, probably because they're relatively longer work weeks, at least on average, and therefore have a, uh, a higher preference than hourly workers uh, for the uh, time off option or exchange of uh, time for income. Um, the recent growth in access seems to be almost exclusively among uh, salary type of workers. Maybe that's reflecting a, a cyclical change through the 2000s. Uh, an issue that hasn't come up yet is just individual workers and labor unions bargaining power uh, to negotiate or win uh, such gains on the front of flexibility if that's what they're seeking. Um, the salary status, however, does not protect workers from being required to work overtime. It's a pretty large segment of those on mandatory overtime that are exempt or salaried people. Um, and then when we look at the consequences, uh, it seems to be on balance uh, more about the choice or inability to refuse overtime than the actual number of hours uh, that that creates some of these negative consequences for workers and their stress levels, fatigue, and work family imbalance. Uh, so maybe, uh, as, as my inner economist, as Nancy Fulbury says, uh, can come out here, that there must be something about the cost of converting jobs that are mostly hourly type of jobs uh, into uh, those that are like salary jobs in terms of their flexibility. There must be something about the cost of doing that or the relatively lower returns that might be inhibiting that. And that's the segue into policy. So the, uh, the inner economist to me says, uh, what we need to do is uh, bite the bull and say, yeah, we do have to maybe incentivize at least the initial adoption for firms that have largely hourly workforces or haven't considered a more extensive flexibility than they might be offering, offering to, uh, to their um, hourly workers uh, to make it a little bit lower hanging fruit for them. Um, and there might be some sort of incentivization, that's not a word, is it? Incentivizing needed uh, to convert jobs between uh, full-time and part-time because the National Survey of Employers, I believe, found that that was actually on the decline. Um, and maybe there's a role for policy to disconnect uh, employee benefits and contributions to them, including Social Security, strictly to, employ, uh, and to employees and maybe attach it to hours so it removes a disincentive to reduce hours. Uh, and maybe there can be some sort of um, com compensatory time program for salaried workers since there seems to be more demand for it there. Uh, that would be difficult under current law because we're not required to track employees' hours if they're exempt. Uh, but there are some interesting examples, I'm sure Ariana can tell us, that um, salaried workers have some sort of inform informal arrangement uh, that they put in an extra day or an extra evening that there's sort of reciprocity and an informal basis going on and all we're talking about here is making it a little bit more formal. Uh, 
Uh, finally, maybe um, the results about mandatory overtime in terms of its involuntary nature mattering more than the sheer duration of hours uh, might suggest that when we pursue policy, uh, we get a little bit more uh, bang uh, if we pursue the legal right to refuse or rights to request uh, that they've had even in Western Europe, as opposed to the uh, European Union style hard ceiling or cap of 48 hours or even uh, as high as 60. Uh, so I just want to remind you why we bother with all this, which is that uh, some of us might take for granted too much uh, because we have it in our jobs. But uh, this, if you're fascinated like I am with the sources of well-being and happiness and not just the uh, data, uh, there's some indication that built into our uh, hard wiring is a passion for control, that we want to be able to uh, influence uh, the course of our own activities and the timing of them, and that has real effects on our health and well-being. And uh, when we lose that control, uh, that might have a disproportionately a worse effect than even gaining that. And uh, if you're not convinced by that, then uh, let me close by citing a highbrow uh, movie the, where uh, the very last scene, uh, an aging, uh, now defunct, uh, punk rock, uh, hard, uh, hard metal, heavy metal rocker is asked what would he be doing other than rock and roll? And he says uh, he'd be a salesperson and asked if he'd be happy. He said, well, I don't know. What are the hours? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lonnie. Um, make sure this is on. As Tammy gets herself ready to go, I just want to say a few things about this, about Lonnie's presentation. Number one, I, to, I made him also take out lots of slides with citations that cited all, all of you people in the Thank room you. that needed to be cited. You were on those slides, okay? But we just needed to, you know, bring the slides down a bit. Um, and obviously it's complicated with using a bunch of different data sets, and we specifically asked Lonnie using our terminology to cut some of the data from these different data sets. Um, one of the things I'd like you guys to do um, as you're thinking about questions, you, questions and comments you want to make in the conversation period is, huh, I'm really surprised that I didn't see any data on X, Y, or Z. Okay, and just note it just so that we can find out whether that data isn't there and that's why it wasn't, you know, noted or actually the data was there but, you know, just got cut out in some slide. Okay, I mean, so I am actually curious from the perspective of an academic, a business practice person or a policy person, what sort of data would you have been interested in hearing? The other thing is as I look at the, um, uh, handout, obviously some of these numbers are still quite small, um, so just to let you know that on our website we will have everyone's PowerPoint, you know, that you can download a nice PowerPoint form and, and increase the font to however much your eyes would desire. Um, okay, and now Tammy. So I too want to thank Hi and Katie and uh, the WF 2010 for inviting me here and um, I'm glad that Maureen went this morning because we, she introduced social science and the touchy-feely <laughs> area that I'm going to delve into. Um, in this conference, much attention has been uh, given to solving the work family, to solving, to discussing the work family conflict through a change in workplace culture and through social policies supporting workplace flexibility. And I would like to turn the attention now to the other side of the problem, to working families. And I would like to suggest that in addition to a change of workplace culture, we need to change the broader culture. And it's not surprising that I talk about culture coming from anthropology. I am referring to, um, to a change in the prevailing idea that was so clearly stated by Ken Kornbla in a Senate hearing. And she said, we tend to view the problem of family time as a private problem that can be solved, and family time, I mean family work conflict, if you want, um, that can be solved by individual families and employers acting on their own. In this presentation, I would like to illustrate how this cultural preference to view work-family conflict as an individual problem rather than a structural one is manifested in parents' everyday talk and interaction with family members. 
For this presentation, I draw on the research conducted by the Center on Everyday Lives of uh, Families at UCLA. And those of you who don't know the Center, we conducted a, a qualitative uh, study where we followed families with videotape similar to reality TV a little bit. We used to tell the families that uh, at the time when we filmed them, the Osborne show was very popular, so we told them that they could act like the Osbournes, which of course they, they did. <laughs> but, um, so I will show you some video data from this, and because of that we can't film the, the screen because of course of confidentiality. Uh, I analyzed parents' talk with researchers in formal interviews, as well as spontaneous interaction of parents with their children. And I used discourse analytic methods to explore both the content and the structure of parents' talk. I focus on parents' moral discourse, which involves the monitoring of tension between the dominant culture narrative of what one should do to be considered a good parent and the parent's personal narrative, what they do and how they evaluate, explain, justify, and feel about it. A moral account is always in reference to a normative, standard, or ideal behavior in relation to which the actual performance is compared and evaluated. Imp implied in moral discourse is the consideration of an ideal way of being and behaving, which might lead to a strive toward what an ideal or what McIntyre called uh, a quest for the good and disappointment when it is not achieved. Morality is deeply embedded in discourse about work-family balance in that parents attempt to reconcile what they do with an ideal way of raising a family. When parents engage in this kind of moral discourse, they attempt to communicate and frame their position, that is to tell their patch of the world and display their moral character. I want to start with a segment from an interview in which we see a father talking about his work life in the US. Um, do we want to turn off the light or can you see the video well? Because I want, I mean, work is important for me, but to me, family is more important, and my kids are more important. Mm -hmm. So that's why I work where I work, and I don't work in a private company where I have to work until nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. I've done that in Spain. I've got mm -hmm. two jobs and work late, so mm -hmm. I prefer to be here at, you know, my kids are five o'clock, and so I'm now six and seven every night. Okay, I'll show you a bit of the transcript so you'll be able to follow some and hopefully the problem with the sound will be fixed. So um, uh, this clip highlights three important ideas that I want to stress. First, the father positions work and family in opposition. He says, work is important for me, but, and but is a contrasting conjunction, to me, family is more important. That's suggesting that family and work are in competition. Second, this father expresses explicitly the ideology of family comes first. To me, family is more important, a comparative more important. And thirdly, the father also suggests that his work situation is a choice, that he has control over which job to select and therefore how much time to invest in work and how much time to invest in family. So he talks about, I prefer, and he says, I've done that and now I do this. I don't work in a corporate, in a company, private company where I would need to work long hours. So I suggest that these three ideas represent a prevalent beliefs in American society and a strong American middle class moral preference, which is that work and family are competing for parents' attention, that good parents, especially mothers, prioritize the family over work, and that this is perceived to be done by choice, that parents can control the degree to which work in infringes on family life, and therefore they are responsible for the situation when work and family conflict and for solving any problems that may ensue. The following segment illustrates well the idea that the responsibility for the degree to which work infringes on family life lies within the individual. This segment tells the story of a family where the mother's job requires her to work long hours at time and how they feel about it. I 
think the family is most healthy um, when we're more together. If, if we're all running around in separate directions and we're not together, I notice um, uh, everybody's happy. Mm -hmm. Kids are happy. Hi, Mom. When are you coming home? I don't know, just ask you. Because I want you to come home. I miss you. Uh, I hate to point the finger at Barb, but her schedule is, is really. She has a bad, I mean, a really hectic schedule. And I know, I know this is true, I don't want to be Barb for bad, but when, when I come home and it's just me and the kids, and, and they're like, oh, where's Mom coming home? I'm like, oh, no, she has a late meeting, she won't be home until it's kind of late tonight, so you want to see her. And they're always going to be disappointed. I can see the disappointment here. Yeah. But, you know, on her days off, she's, you know, wakes up by, you know, being with the kids and all that, so it's, 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 it's tough for them. I hope you hear some of it. We don't have very good sound here right now. Anyway, there are a number of things that I want to highlight in this segment, and uh, let's begin with the father. So, what he has to say about his family, what makes his family healthy. So he may apologize for it, but he definitely points a finger at his wife, <laughs> thus framing the lack of family togetherness as her fault attributing to her direct responsibility for her work schedule, for the children's disappointment, and for the family not being as healthy as it could be. The mother, in fact, agrees with the father and seems to view the lack of time spent with the children as her own failing as a parent. This is evident from her expression of guilt, I don't feel good about it, and dissatisfaction and labeling of the situation as terrible. Finally, both parents do not simply resign and accept the situation. The father ends this blame sequence with a suggestion that the mother makes up the hours, attempting to restore the mother's moral character. The mother also ends her narrative, and I haven't shown that part, um, saying, telling the researcher that she tries. Um, she says, so I try to make up those hours. Note that she, it's an effort, that it's not guaranteed, but that she at least tries to make up those hours, suggesting that she feels compelled and responsible to come up with compromising solution or compensation. In summary, this excerpt <clears throat> illustrates the perception that the loss of the problem and solution reside within the individual parents. In the next segment, a mother perceives her work schedule as diminishing both hers as well as her children's well-being. Any other things that don't fit with your idea of well-being in your present life? Um, again, I mean, just my work hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I wish that I worked less because mm -hmm. part of my well-being would be spending more time with my kids or seeing the moms you know, go to class with their kids during the school year. I wish I could do that more, and I can't. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be beneficial for the kids. Even Sarah said to me, how come so-and-so's mom can come and you can't? Mm -hmm. Or you won't is her perception and makes me feel bad. Um, not feel well because it's not that I don't want to, it's just that I can't. It doesn't fit into what I'm doing. Um, 
So this mother regrets that her work schedule does not allow her to do what stay-home moms do, volunteer at school. An aggravating factor is the mother's feeling that her daughter interprets the situation as if she doesn't want to be there. How come so-and-so mom can come and you can't or you won't, is her perception, she says. The mother frames the situation as diminishing her well-being and she expresses guilt, I don't feel good about it, I don't feel well, a mark of negative self-evaluation of her own parenting. The mother's parenting becomes an indirect topic in the following bedtime conversation between the father and Sarah. Sarah is the daughter that the mother mentioned. She's a kindergartner. And I apologize, but this was filmed at bedtime in the dark, and you may make out the shadows of the father sitting on the bed, uh, on the daughter's bed, but that's what we got. Huh? Keep up on the calendar, like this little picture of something, and it comes us from the big teddy bear's picnic is. And you saw it coming as of tomorrow? Tomorrow. Thing? I'm sorry I can't make it, though, love. Daddy just can't get to everything. I got to dance, which I thought was really well, important. Well, people's moms are going to come like ten moms. Yeah. That's going to be another mom. Well, there's a lot of moms that don't work, honey, and they have other kids, and they, they stay at home, and they're stay-at-home moms. They don't have any other kids. There's a few stay-at-home dads, too. Oh, you know, oh, maybe that's their first baby. Oh, that's their first baby in kindergarten. Yeah, but if mom comes, you know she has um, her sister. Well, we don't want mommy to feel bad, you know. She tries to get to things, too. You know, she's a good, hard-working well, person. I get her things, and I will. In this interaction, Sarah articulates her desire that her parents attend the teddy bear picnic at school the next morning. The father expresses regrets for not being able to attend it, but his response suggests that he feels that his inability to attend the event challenges his identity as a moral person and a good parent. So he continues with a defensive account, recount of how he did attend some other events which he thought were important, which I thought was important, can be understood as if the father is in tune with what is truly important to his daughter, or that the father prioritized the dance because Sarah indicated that it was important, that pass, thus passing the responsibility for choosing what to attend onto his daughter. In either cases, the father presents himself as doing the right thing. The daughter does not respond to the father's moral work, but rather indicates that the one she expects to show up is the mother, whom she portrays as the one who never comes to her school event. So how come they're never mine? There we go. This presents the father with uh, the obligation to defend his wife's moral, moral character and good parenting, and so he launches into a number of explanations and justifications why other mothers can attend school events while he, Sarah's mom can't. But Sarah continuously rejects her father's reasoning. So he says, well, there's this, well, there's that, and says, yes, but they don't, but maybe, well. All these words that indicate to us that there's an attempt and an opposition. At this point, the father resorts to doing two things. He first attempts to, um, to uh, it first appeals to Sarah's uh, empathy and wants her to simply view the situation from her mom's perspective, that she tries to get to things too, meaning that the mother has the good intention at heart and even makes the effort, she tries. And so Sarah should be kind and not scrutinize her. The second thing that the father does is that he presents the mother as a moral person by saying that she is a good, hard-working person. This comment, however, puts in juxtaposition work and family. If you are, if you are a hard-working person, can you also be a good parent? This question seems to be answered by the prevailing ideology that when it comes to work and family conflict, family comes first. That is, when you cannot do both well, morally, you should select the family. This ideology functions as a measuring stick for interpreting parents' everyday actions in their daily life, in their family life. Every time parents fail to put family first, they fail individually as moral actors and good parents. The perception of individual responsibility is further evident in accounts 
um, which portray a sense of inadequacy, guilt, and dissatisfaction. I don't feel good about it. It's terrible. Finally, parents' desire to compensate and find compromising solutions reflect their perception that it is up to them to solve such problems, that they must be self-reliant. What seems to be missing from these parents' discourse discourses is the recognition that many, if not all, working families are in the same situation, meaning that this is a collective issue derived from a broader structural problem and institutional culture, and that the solution lies in the public sphere rather than in individual efforts. In other words, these parents, in the way they deal with the work-family conflict, mirror the prevailing cultural view that problems of the family are private matters and are not the responsibility of society and or the government. To further make the point that this has to do with a cultural perception of individual responsibility and self-reliance, I want to, um, to mention a study that my colleagues in Italy and I conducted in which we compared parents' discourses on work-family balance, both Italian and U.S. parents. What we found is that both Italian and U.S. parents in our study recognize the work that work infringes on family life, but for the Italian parents, the existence uh, the existing reality does not, regardless of how close it, ma it matches to the <coughs> ideal, is not, it's still presented as satisfying. And failures are not viewed as breaking personal moral integrity. Italian parents simply never expressed any guilt or dissatisfaction or disappointment. When discussing the degree to which their work enters the home and family life, Italian parents present the need to work on weekends or to be absent from home because of work as part of life and a normal routine, an approach which rejects, uh, rejects any negative implications for one's morality and good parenting, but views work and family meshing as an integral part of daily life. In that work, we argue that the difference in, parent, in Italian parents' response to work-family conflict mirrors a cultural expectation that the state and its institution participate in protecting the family sphere. Indeed, matching these cultural expectations, Article 31 of the Italian Constitution states that it, uh, that it is a governmental duty to support the family, both economically and socially, and to protect both children and parents. Public discourse in Italy positions the family as a partner of broader network of institutions such as the state, public services, education system, and the church. The idea that family responsibility can be diffused across institutions beyond the nuclear family is also visible in governmental legislation and implementation of policies such as paid parental leave and others. Similarly to the Italian parents who reflect in their discourse the Italian reality of partnership between families in the institution, so do our parents mirror the hands-off approach of the government and the cultural preference to treat the family and its issues as private matters. I want to close with Robert Putnam, who in Bowling Alone uh, calls for a return to civic engagement in part because it allows citizens to resolve collective problems more easily. While I completely agree with Putnam, I suggest that what is missing in his discussion is the recognition that citizens don't necessarily view their problems as collective and therefore are less motivated to return to civic engagement. I have attempted to show here through the examination of parents' discourse that U.S. parents perceive work and family conflict as a personal problem that they need to resolve on their own. I want to suggest that in order to solve the work-family tension, there is a need not only to change the culture of the workplace, but also the broader culture and increased awareness that work-family conflict is a structural problem with structural solutions rather than individual ones. Thank you. And we're going to have the response from the uh, reactions from Kathy Lingle in terms of a business um, uh, practice perspective. Um, then we will take our break, and I strongly urge folks to just open the doors and walk outside so you get some air. And I do have to say, as Kathy gets ready, that uh, Katie mentioned to me that she thought that her kids, Jack and Edith, 
knew my voice so well because she was constantly talking to me while she was pregnant, you know, so they heard me. <laughs> but I'm just waiting for that videotape of Jack and Eve to go, what, you have to go to Chai again? And she has some meaning, so hopefully there won't be a videotape at that point. Um, and um, Kathy. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to clear that for you. Thank you. I will echo all of my predecessors' thanks for being here, but I would also propose I'm the most surprised attendee, um, invitee, uh, which gives me particular poignance at being here. I think I am one of the newer Sloan grantees and probably one of the smallest, but I'll let impact um, <laughs> percolate through and maybe that will uh, become more obvious as we go forward. But thank you very much to the Sloan Foundation for inviting me here. This is my first time at a Sloan conference, and I was delighted when I was invited until I was told I had to do this particular task, which I find very challenging. Anyone who knows me knows that I can't say anything in five minutes, but I'm going to do my best. I am not, I, I have worked at probably, um, oh, a dozen corporations during my very long um, career and a few nonprofits. I am at a nonprofit now. So just to give you a little context, I'm going to, uh, so I've had a lot of experience in business. I'm not going to defend business. I'm going to try to interpret what the world looks like from a business context. And you can decide for yourselves sides, opinions, whether any of this makes sense. But I have some definite reactions to the things I've heard. Um, um, and by the way, one of the, the most formative um, uh, uh, company I've worked for is KPMG, where I spent six and a half years attempting to change the culture. I have to confess I am a change agent from my Peace Corps days, which was my first job, if you will, if you want to call that a job. I am a radical. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a bipartisan radical. I'm radical to everybody. And I happen to think, I happen to think that work life, having been a practitioner for six years, is one of the most radical endeavors that goes on within business and the hardest work that I have ever done. So let me tell you some, um, some of the things I've learned sitting inside the beast. Um, Lonnie talked about control. In fact, control has come up all, all during the day. And control is essential, um, very important concept. And we'll come back to that in several ways. Um, and the uh, aspect of control, which um, has great relevance when we're talking about flexibility, of course, is choice. Who has the control and who has choice? And how does that work within, within the business context? Money. Um, I'd like to uh, make a statement about business which may or may not make sense to you. There is more money within business than anybody appreciates. And when there isn't money for something, it's, it's, a, it's a question of priorities, not the absolute existence of money. There's all kinds of money. And I think that's going to be a key to maybe how we could collaborate in the future. What happens in business is they don't spend their money very well, like in all other kinds of institutions. There are priorities in the way it gets spent, but there's lots and lots of money. There's certainly a lot of money to pay people at the top of the organization. They keep people in organizations who don't do very good jobs. I mean, it's spent in rather interesting ways. Um, one of the things I would like to first talk about is the perception of family within business in response to um, what Tammy was talking about. And I guess my theme is going to be schizophrenia, which is even more extreme than the gaps that Lonnie is talking about. Business is totally schizophrenic about family. And what I think is interesting is that business is defining family in very radical ways. It's business, after all, who is deciding that same-sex um, couples get benefits. And they've been on the front line, even in a society that I think has been turning incredibly more to the right, if you will, about rights and who should get married and what family is. Business is out there um, on the front line saying that families are all sorts of interesting compositions and arrangements. On the other hand, business does not like family. 
They don't want family on their premises. They don't want to think about family. And one of the things that I would um, um, suggest, which has occurred to me watching Tammy's videos and some of that information, is these videos need to be shown in corporate boardrooms. They don't know much about family, and they don't want to know much about family. Family is a cost. But they're, on the other hand, they're leading the charge, saying that all the changes in family, they are defending, and they are um, paying for benefits for families that a lot of people in the country would say should not be done. Um, and they're also dealing with blended families and um, a lot of other sort of interesting things. And I think the most recent issue where family is perceived negatively, of course, was the whole comment period and kind of the responses to the Family and Medical Leave Act 15 years later, where you can see antipathy towards family and family situations. Um, another point I'd like to make within business is the exchange relationship, which we talk about at World at Work in our total rewards model, is very much alive. In the best businesses and many businesses, there, by the exchange relationship, I mean dialoguing between the employee and the employer, and lots of interesting um, negotiations going on and great progress being made when both sides are at the table. I think there's more and more and more of that. What I've learned, though, in my current organization, which is an HR professional association, is HR professionals, interestingly enough, sometimes don't get that point. And they are enormous gatekeepers. And they are not always the friend of the policies and some of the initi initiatives that are represented in this room. So it's very important to be able to communicate and translate and make sure that HR professionals, to whom um, leadership teams within corporations take their guidance, that they are much more in communication and contact with what's represented here, including the data. My third point is that flexibility is a very emotional topic in business. Business leaders, interestingly enough, and I was remember at an accounting firm where you'd think numbers would win the day, the business case and research is necessary, but it's never sufficient. I actually got more um, uh, policies passed and implemented when I was at KPMG by a very emotional situation um, that would just come up impromptu and the leadership would totally go with the program, so to speak. Backup child care is one example I'm thinking of, when a woman senior partner who brought in $6 million a year worth of business, who was told she could not have a baby 10 years before she was infertile, suddenly had a baby. And the, the firm turned itself inside out to keep her working when, um, you know, her baby wasn't sick, but she needed to be home with the baby. That's how we got emergency backup child care. So I think a lot of um, the key to talking to business is to combine the data with stories about people that the senior leadership really cares about with videos and pictures. Because in business, a lot of people are very graphically, visually oriented, and that's how they receive their data instead of through numbers. But the numbers are there. But they need to be smaller and they need to be concise. Um, I think I'm running out of time, but I'd just like to make the point that in spite of however all of this is coming across, I'm incredibly optimistic because I think there's more similarity in where we're going with business and even with policy. And I think the whole discussion about health care is one of those areas. Um, one of the hugest concerns, of course, is the rise in health care. And I think the research going on in the work-life field about the connection between flexibility and mental and physical health outcomes is an area that, should, that deserves a great more uh, deal of emphasis. I think innovation is of tremendous concern to business leaders and losing our, ed our edge innovatively. And I think flexibility and the con cultural conditions that create innovation and creativity mm -hmm. are vital. I think men need a lot of attention, and we've talked about men. I think that's going to be the tipping point, and I think we're just about there, and we need to spend a lot more time talking to business leaders as the men they usually are. Thank you.